I'm Ken Harbaugh, host of Warriors in Their Own Words. If you love listening to this show as much as I love hosting it, I think you'll really like the Medal of Honor podcast produced in partnership with the Medal of Honor Museum. Each episode talks about a genuine American hero and the actions that led to their receiving our nation's highest award for valor. They're just a few minutes each, so if you're looking for a show to fill time between these Warriors episodes, I think you'll love the Medal of Honor podcast. Search for the Medal of Honor podcast wherever you get your shows. Thanks. I'm Ken Harbaugh, host of Warriors in Their Own Words. In partnership with The Honor Project, we've brought this podcast back at a time when our nation needs these stories more than ever. Warriors in Their Own Words is our attempt to present an unvarnished, unsanitized truth of what we have asked of those who defend this nation. Thank you for listening, and by doing so, honoring those who have served. Today, we'll hear from Major James Dunning. Dunning served in the British Army during World War II as a commando and fought in the unsuccessful Dieppe raid in August of 1942. In this final part of his interview, Major Dunning describes the infamous Dieppe raid and becoming an instructor at the Achnacarry Castle. I must set the scene. 1942, Hitler is marched into Russia, hammering on the doors of Moscow. His forces are in. America is in the war. Their forces are over here. There is a hue and cry from the communists, from Soviet and in Britain, for a second front now. The Americans see no reason for a second front. The combined chiefs of staff say, no, we're not ready. There should be some big reconnaissance in force before we do a invasion of Normandy to see if we can capture a port. This is basically, without going into a lot of details, the idea. So with a lot of political pressure from Russia, America, and Canada, because the Canadians... A division had been in Britain since 1940, just kicking its heels and hadn't seen a shot fired in anger. So it was decided to have a reconnaissance in force on a major uh, occupied port, and the one selected was Dieppe. This plan was agreed early in 42 by Mountbatten, Chief of Combined Operations, and was uh, to go ahead. Then there was some difficulty in mounting it and it, uh, ironing out the technicalities of whether it should be preceded by, by an aerial raid and bombing, which would jeopardize and aggravate and probably kill a lot of French people and so on. And it was put on hold. There was further pressure from Stalin and uh, Churchill and further pressure from America, and it was put on, and is put on very quickly. And whereby in the first original plan, the Canadian division would land, and with a great list of objectives, the two uh, coastal batteries, which dominated the beaches where they would be landing, would be taken out by parachuters. Because of the conditions, limiting conditions, when the operation was remounted of employing airborne troops, they were taken out of the plan and two commandos were put in, number three and number four. And number f uh, became number 40, Royal Marine Commander, had a role uh, to bring back boats, but they weren't involved in knocking out the two batteries. So here we are, a new scheme uh, a new operation whereby three commando and four commando would take out the two batteries prior to the landing by the Canadian division on the Canadian beaches in front of the town and at two small resorts to the west and to the east. Now, four commando, uh, which I will deal with, had the objective of what was called Hess Battery. 
uh, and that consisted of six 75 millimeter or their equivalent uh, guns, and that was about a thousand yards inland. And the plan was devised by Shumi Lord Lovett, and he, uh, we all had great respect for Lord Lovett. Not only was he a brilliant leader, but he was a good tactician. And uh, he decided that uh, the plan would be very simple to knock out this battery. One group would land just on the beach, a thousand yards from the target, climb the cliffs, and then engage that battery of small arms fire while his party, the main party, would do a sweeping, flanking attack and come in to the rear of the battery. And ours in C Troop uh, was to get in front of the battery and engage it with small arms fire. And uh, I was troop sergeant major then, and I had with me the uh, two-inch mortar uh, with horn and uh, dough. Two good blokes, two good buddies, number one and number two. Contrasting in personalities, Dale, who was number one and actually fired the thing, a Glaswegian, tough Glaswegian horn, a rather rural, ruddy-faced lad, as strong as an ox, who could carry all the bombs and so on. So there we go. We landed. Uh, we uh, landed and got up to a position in front of the battery. Uh, we all got in good firing positions and we waited. There was no question of people getting up there and firing off. It had to be a really orchestrated crescendo of fire. And so we all got to a position. And uh, I got the mortar up in front. The mortars are very haphazard. There's only a pipe with a firing pin at the bottom, you shove a bomb down it, that hits the pin, you, know, you turn the handle, and away it goes. There's no uh, sights on it, you just point it in the direction, and according to the range you want, so you just elevate it up or down like that. So we got in a nice firing position, and we decided that we would fire right in the middle of the battery. We'd see the battery in front of us, and in fact, we could see a chap in white, so we presume was the cook, which suggested that they didn't know we were there before we opened up our fire. That because they started the, in the battery to fire while we were still in position. But we were told, and we had infiltrated our job, not one bloke fires until you get the signal. And that was a whistle, whistle signal. And everybody takes sights, spring gunners, snipers, but nobody fire until you, and so we thought we'd fire right in the middle. The first one went off, and then the second to the right, and then we thought, right, we'll put this one slightly in the middle, over a little bit, right there. And it was the luckiest shot of the war, because it landed plump into a ammunition. And then it went up. By this time, the battery had started firing, but after that, it never fired again. And uh, there was fire going on, and, that, and a lot of people, Germans, were killed in that area. Uh, but the Germans' credit, they rallied round and fired back and so on. But that was really, I must admit, a lucky shot. It was just, they thought, well, there's bound to be something in the middle. And they had stacked their ammunition there. We didn't realise the impact it would make, quite frankly, you know, because a lot of explosions there had been that they were firing off, you know, and we could see the continuation, but we didn't know really. The only thing we did realise is that the guns didn't fire anymore. And so, right, it's... Uh, and there was a lot. There, there, I mean, there's a flak tower on that, and they were firing at us, and some mortars were firing. It was just part of the scenario and uh, the brain gunners on the flanks and our snipers were picking off people in the the battery uh, there's a lot of going on you know just one of the things you know 
See, our role was to uh, knock out the battery and then re-embark and then go round to be uh, available as a reserve in case we were needed. Well, by the time we had uh, re-embarked and got in position to go and into his reserve, there had been this chaos on the actual landing. And I don't think I, that they knew the control ships and that weren't really in the picture, didn't know. They knew that, A, it was late. The whole main force was late in getting uh, ashore and the reports were bad. The armour, 34 tanks knocked out on the beach and the outcome, 4,000, or near enough, killed, wounded and captured by mainly Canadians. Overhead, tremendous dogfights, more than the Battle of Britain. We lost the British, Canadian, American Air Force, 100, or over 100 aircraft that day and the Germans lost more. It was a decisive air battle, and that's often been neglected as one of the outcomes of the uh, Dieppe raid, the decisive air battle over Dieppe that day. Coming back, incidentally, we picked up an American airman who parachuted down there on landing craft, and we picked him up and brought him back. The Germans hailed it as a second front repulsed. And a lot of people in this country said, oh, you know, it was a second front effort. But it was never. I mean, give you one example. We didn't take any rations, hard rations or anything. I mean, if we were going to stay there, we'd have had some form of, uh, of a feeding range. But it was just a raid. Uh, no, I don't say... The, the, because of the success, that one success and that battery, the whole thing was uh, held as a commando raid. In actual fact, the three and four commandos were only a small part of it, a very small part. Some few hundred uh, were within a, a total landing force of over 5,000, of which 4,000 became casualties. Tragic, tragic. Many people, in fact, in fact uh, my very good friend, Pat Porteous, who got a VC uh, to his dying day, he died only a few weeks ago, maintained that it should not have been uh, held. All the lessons could have been learnt in uh, exercises. But the, the pundits say, no, we learned a very crucial lesson there, that we could not capture a port. And then you got the mulberry and the artificial harbour, and so on. We had a very uh, well thought out and practised plan of thinning out. We, who had been in the woods and engaged uh, the battery from the onset, were responsible for what we call leapfrogging back and to give a cover to the guys who'd been in the battery who were going to come down this path. Uh, it was not a question of right up sticks and half a lever for the, the boat. Thin out. One group, go back two or three hundred yards, and then when the last of the chaps from the battery, Lovett's group, come through, they would come back well, through, in turn, another group who'd gone through them in the first instance, what we call leapfrogging back down this path. While we were going down there, we were mortared and there was some sniping. And then there was another group actually on the beach. Um, Sergeant Langlands and his uh, section were actually on the beach to stop any Germans who might have come along the beach to interfere with our re-embarkation. The landing craft had gone off and uh, lay off and cruising around uh, off the actual where we had landed because we re-embarked on the same beach that we had landed initially underneath the two cuts in the cliff. And then they came in and uh, we waded out because the tide was going out. We waded out and re-embarked. And there was a fair amount of sniping, but 
what we done, we had uh, uh, put down uh, some large smoke canisters and the three-inch mortar, not the two-inch mortar, also put down some smoke which uh, screened off the uh, re-embarkation area from both flanks. So we re-embarked through smoke and the landing craft came in and took away. It went very well, really, considering, you know, a small arms fire and that going on. Uh, no problem, really. We lost 19 men, and each year I go back and we have our own monument in Vorangeville with all the names up there, and uh, only this August I went and we read out the names or I read out the name. Uh, we had a certain number wounded. Uh, I can't off the top of my head remember uh, the exact number. And one very brave medical orderly who stayed behind. He was perfectly all right, but he stayed behind to look after the wounded. And uh, he became a prisoner of war for the rest of the war. And unfortunately, the two of them, uh, both medical orderlies, Joe Pasquale and his brother Jim, and uh, one stayed behind. The other uh, continued to serve number four. And when Joe was released, he had to find out that his brother had been killed on D-Day. It was very sad uh, to sacrifice your own self like that, incarcerate yourself in a prisoner of war camp, and then find that your brother had been killed subsequently. Uh, so uh, that was sad. I'll tell you one thing which I thought epitomized the horrors and the of war. When we went up to go to the battery, just to the right of the path, incidentally, on the path were signs, Achten Minden, or Danger Mines. Very obliging, the Germans. They had signed where the mines were. Of course, that was for the local people and people like that. But we thought it was rather funny. Keep away from that side of the path because they had put notices up, Danger Mines, you know. But going up on the field on the right, the cattle were grazing. It was a lovely morning, beautiful blue sky, 19th of August. And there were peaceful, just... It was quite peaceful then, except for some aircraft, but relatively peaceful. When we came back, some of the cattle had been killed in the bombardment and that. And that, to me, epitomised the horrors of war, you know, just a little thing. With the busy fall season already in swing, you might be looking for wholesome, convenient meals for jam-packed days. Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit, can help you fuel up fast with chef-prepared, dietitian approved ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. You'll save time, eat well, and stay on track with your healthy lifestyle. Level up with Gourmet Plus options, prepared to perfection by chefs and ready-to-eat in record time. Treat yourself to upscale meals with premium ingredients like broccolini, leeks, truffle butter, and asparagus. Looking for calorie-conscious options? Try delicious, dietitian approved calorie-smart meals with around or less than 550 calories per serving. Need an extra boost to support your wellness goals and feel your best as you tackle a busy autumn? Try Protein Plus meals with 30 grams of protein or more per serving. With Factor, you can rest assured you're making a sustainable choice. We offset 100% of our delivery emissions, source 100% renewable electricity for our production sites and offices, and feature sustainably sourced seafood in our meals. This September, get Factor and enjoy eating well without the hassle. Simply choose your meals and enjoy fresh, flavor-packed meals delivered to your door. Ready in just two minutes, no prep, no mess. Head to factormeals.com slash warriors50 and use code warriors50 to get 50% off. That's code warriors50 at factormeals.com slash warriors50 to get 50% off. We often hear about the individuals who took the oath of office to become the chief executive. But what about the other people who play a role in each administration or the events that may not be as well known 
but that contribute to the reshaping of the office of the American presidency. On the presidencies of the United States, we explore each administration beyond just the person holding the highest elected office in order to better understand the history that brought us to the modern day presidency. I hope you'll join me on this journey through the annals of presidential history. Presidencies can be found anywhere fine podcasts can be found and is a proud member of the Evergreen Podcast Network. I was a sound major of C Troop, and uh, then uh, Lovett, after Dieppe, suggested that I should be- take a commission, be, uh, become an officer in commandos. And uh, I was very honored and flattered and uh, accepted that. And when I was commissioned, I was then sent up to Atnacarry. Everybody, when they were commissioned, had to go up there to, you know, uh, a certain administrative things to do when you get commissioned. You have to have a bank account and all that sort of thing, a new uniform and that. And so while I was up at Acna Carry, which was the training centre, the commandant, the CO, the uh, colonel there, was a man who had been the second in command and number four commander and knew me as a sergeant major. And he said, I'd like you to stay here as an instructor. And I... I, I said, yes, I would. I'll uh, do that for a while. I was very keen on training. I like training. I like the physical side. So um, he said, right, and uh, he promoted me. I became a captain instructor, uh, first a teaching field craft, and then I had what was called a training commando. I had uh, 200 trainees, an uh, overall command of them, in four troops of 50. And I enjoyed that. And then after 15 months, I'd had enough of it. And then I went to join a commando. But unfortunately, uh, I went parachuting and had a parachute accident. And when I came out of hospital, the war was finishing. At Ringway, the last jump was a night jump. And it was from a balloon. And I had what they call late oscillation. That was a swinging of the parachute. And I was pulling down on my back lift webs, not realizing I was near the ground. And as I pulled down, so of course my legs came up and I drifted in hard on my spine. And uh, I fractured my spine at the base here. So I was in plaster. But I went parachuting again after the war and finished up in the parachute regiment at Suez. (laughs) <laughs> so there we go. But um, Acna Carry was a marvellous training centre, probably the finest has ever been. And when I wrote my book, I, Lord Lovett was all for me devoting the book purely to training. And he said, and I hope you'll t- uh, emphasise that at Acna Carry there was training by leadership. No bullying. No bullying. And that's very true. I mean, admittedly, we shouted and chivied, but there's no malicious, because every instructor wanted to get his troop through. They were his lads, and he wanted to get them through. The death slide was... uh, the, the Acne Carry is uh, the, uh, the castle on the River Arcade. It is the, uh, uh, the home of the chief of the Cameron clan. And all over the river, wide river, fast flowing, connects two locks, and lovely beech trees all the way along Great Avenue. And from one side to the other, we had a slide. We had a rope bridge made of toggle ropes, and you crossed over the rope bridge, and to add to the excitement, especially when the rangers came up there, we used to throw explosives in. So that would shoot up water as they were crossing over the rope bridge. And then when they got to the other side, they climbed up a tree, and they took their toggle rope up and slid down the death slide. And it was very, very exhilarating, very nice. But the whole way along that piece were a series of rope uh, obstacle, well, r- rope 
erections so that you had uh, scrambling necks, a single rope where you went on what's called the leopard claw and so on, and then two ropes and so on. Derby's 1st Battalion of Rangers had their bloodbath at Atnacarry. And the great thing about Atnacarry, your training started before you ever reached camp because the railhead centre was seven miles from camp and when they arrived there, after a long trek up from Glasgow across the highlands and the moors, you were told, right, get outside, put your kit bags on the trucks and get fell in because you marched the seven miles to Atnacarry. And when you got to Atnacarry, there was a guard room and along beside the guard room was a cemetery with crosses. And it had on them, this man looked over the top of cover and stood around the side. So that was fatal. He drove this, looked over the top and stood around the side. He'd get bumped off. This man didn't clean his rifle and so on. And the question we're always asked, are those true, uh, was that a true cemetery or not? And the rangers, when they came up, one of the guys said, Jesus Christ, uh, the son of the bitches, they kill us on the uh, march up from the railhead, and when we get here, they bury us. <laughs> yeah, so was it true or false, the graveyard? Well, that's a conundrum that's never been answered. No one knew the word commando, except those who had been in the Boer War. But by 1942, the word commando and commando training epitomised the training of the elite forces, not only the Allies, but subsequently of all nations. And the Greenberry has been accepted as the uh, symbol, together with, of course, with the Maroon Beret, but that's a specific airborne uh, symbol. Incidentally, the first airborne troops in Britain were commandos. Number two commando was designated right from the start as the parachute commando, and they pioneered parachuting and became the first paratroops and eventually became the first battalion of the parachute regiment. I don't think there's any one proud moment there's so many moments that gave me great satisfaction. The moments, too, of course, when there are great disappointments. But I still meet up with my old comrades, and uh, there's something indefinable about the comradeship we enjoyed together. It's something you just can't put your finger on, say there's one reason, any more than I can say, any one proud moment. The association I had with those chaps, many of them have gone now. Those who weren't killed in the war are subsequently gone. And it's a comradeship which was uh, hammered out in training and forged in action that uh, was probably gives me the proudest thing, the association. That would be it, I think. The proudest thing was knowing these guys and having served with them. I would say uh, after the war, I was a regular soldier. Uh, after the war, uh, when I left commandos, because the army commanders were disbanded and the Royal Marines took over, I went back to my infantry battalion in Palestine and... They were a good lot of chaps, but there wasn't that edge. There wasn't that little something that bonded them together and made them... Their morale not quite as high. It's a, uh, a difference between a, a world beater, as you might say, in athletics, or the, the national level. Just that little bit of extra. And... Uh, that came, I think, because of this thing I mentioned earlier. If you didn't have first-class blokes, they were kicked out. Whereas in the infantry battalion, normal regiment, you have to try and soldier on and make the best of the material you've got. 
you can't really pick and choose. You're landed and loaded with what you've got, and you've got to make the best of it. And it's a very difficult task. But it um, is a, a big difference between the two. That was Major James Dunning. To learn more about Dunning and his experiences, check out his book, The Fighting Fourth. The link is in the show description. Thanks for listening to Warriors in Their Own Words. If you have any feedback, please email the team at kharbaugh at evergreenpodcast.com. We're always looking to improve the show. For updates and more, follow us on Twitter at team underscore Harbaugh. And if you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to rate and review. Warriors in Their Own Words is a production of Evergreen Podcasts in partnership with The Honor Project. Our producer is Declan Roars. Bridget Coyne is our production director, and Sean Rolhoffman is our audio engineer. Special thanks to Evergreen executive producers Joan Andrews, Michael DeAloya, and David Moss. I'm Ken Harbaugh, and this is Warriors in Their Own Words. We often hear about the individuals who took the oath of office to become the chief executive. But what about the other people who play a role in each administration or the events that may not be as well known, but that contribute to the reshaping of the office of the American presidency? On the presidencies of the United States, we explore each administration beyond just the person holding the highest elected office in order to better understand the history that brought us to the modern day presidency. I hope you'll join me on this journey through the annals of presidential history. Presidencies can be found anywhere fine podcasts can be found and is a proud member of the Evergreen Podcast Network.